Hello and welcome to part two about turning a one pound cheapo laser into an analog remote control to drive, say, a motor or analog meter. A link to part one should be appearing above now. I'm now taking you on a journey from my lasing diode across a boring wall, past a packet of heat shrink to a cracked mirror. Well, that's good luck for you, isn't it? And the laser beam is now reflected back down. And incidentally, this is about a four meter journey back down to the receiver's photo diode. So to the setup, firstly on the left hand side we have the oscilloscope set to 5 milliseconds per division. Then we move slightly over to the right where we have the laser driver as explained in my previous video. Then we move over to the right hand side we can now see the photodiode that receives the laser light. Then moving slightly to the left we have the receiver board which is the subject of this video and then finally the moving coil meter in the center there that acts as a type of motor from the receiver output. It's worth me mentioning that this receiver is in harmony with with my laser diode driver board is very simple and basic. It could be a great deal more sophisticated than it is, but it's not. First of all, I'll go through from left to right a simple block diagram way, and then I'll go back over this circuit in finer detail. So firstly, we have an input from the photodiode through this capacitor C2 into a high gain amplifier with Q1 and Q2. This then triggers a monostable multivibrator of the 555, the output of which goes into a low pass second order filter and then finally output to a 0 to 5 milliamp moving coil meter. And now to the finer explanation. From the input of the photodiode it needs a certain voltage and a certain bias current. This is derived from R8 which drops from about 13 volts DC, R12, the Zener diode here which is a 4.7 volts DC Zener diode, therefore creating at this point here 4.7 volts DC, and the bias, the current bias is set by R7. The signal goes via C2 into a high gain amplifier of my own design. I like a bit of analog design. You could have used an op amp here. I could have done that, but I chose not to because I find analog design fun. It's got a high input impedance established by this 2N3819, which is a JFET transistor. And the gate resistance, as you can see here, which is R3, is set to 2.7 mega ohm. That's quite a high impedance. So it doesn't load the output signal from the photodiode. There are two transistors in this high gain amplifier, Q1 and Q2. Q2 is a PNP and the feedback network for this amplifier is set via R6 over R4. And given that R6 is 100K, and R4 is 100 ohm, this produces a gain of about 1000 or 60 dB. The signal then outputs via C5 and gets differentiated by C5 
R13 and R10. The positive going potential of the signal triggers the 555 configured as a monostable. And each pulse, which is a 2.1 millisecond pulse, is derived via C7 and R11 in series with R16. So why did I do that? That's to obtain a precise resistance of 40.2K and that produces my 2.1 milliseconds pulse. The output of the 555, which is pin 3, goes into a second order low pass filter derived from C9, R15, which is 680 ohms, and C6, and R14, which is 820. And that drives the 0 to 5 milliamp meter. If you set the potentiometer on the laser driver board to approximately midway, that produces a frequency of at this receiver of 160 hertz, which is identical with 2.5 milliamps on the moving coil meter. So what else is to be said here? Firstly, the amplifier I design, the analog design, has not been thoroughly tested. That is, it hasn't been checked for repeatability of the transistors or indeed the thermal response. But it appears to be OK and might be quite a good audio amplifier. I haven't tested it so far for that. The input has a diode which is D2 and that is reverse protection. I've actually got a polyfuse in series with the supply voltage here so if I accidentally reverse the polarity the polyfuse would heat up and open up. What else? We have a decoupling capacitor here of C4 and I think that's about it. Ah, I've just had a thought, and that is when you set the laser driver board potentiometer at a minimum, you will achieve a frequency of about 36 hertz on the output of the 555. And at a maximum potentiometer setting, uh, you can it will achieve 316 hertz. And that is equivalent on the moving coil meter of about 0 0.5 milliamps, which is the minimum, through to 5 milliamps for the maximum frequency. This is a scope picture taken from both the laser driver board and receiver board. The lower blue trace represents the laser drive of a 600 microsecond pulse. The yellow upper trace is triggered by the positive going edge of the lower blue trace and establishes a 2.1 millisecond pulse on the receiver board to drive the moving coil meter. The lower blue trace is taken from the output of the 7805 on the driver board and the yellow upper trace is taken from the output of the 555, that's pin 3, of the receiver board. Throughout this video I've been calling the photodiode a photodiode. In fact it's not, it's a phototransistor. I've had these devices in stock for quite some while and they didn't really have a label on them so I couldn't really tell quite what they were but it's definitely a phototransistor and the manufacturer is Vicehay and the device part number is a TEPT4400 that's T for Tommy, E for Edward, P for Peter, T for Tommy 440 quite a nice device 
it has the spectral response of the human eye. I thought I'd finish up by demonstrating just one or two facets that I haven't shown before of this laser setup. One is, I'll demonstrate that it is actually a laser system that's driving this structure by cutting the beam. So let me do that. There we go. And again, and again, and again. The other thing that I would demonstrate is that if this laser beam was going to go over any distance, and hopefully you can see the meter there that's approximately at two and a half milliamps, but if this is to go over any distance at all, there would be humidity and dust in between the laser beam and the receiver. Well, to kind of simulate that, I've got two fairly flimsy pieces of tissue. And so if I put that over the phototransistor, let's see what happens. There it is. And look at that. The laser beam, even though the power of this laser beam is very, very low, and the distance between the transmitter and the receiver is somewhere between four and five meters, you can see that the laser beam is quite able to penetrate two layers, admittedly thin tissue. But that would simulate a bit of dust or humidity between the transmitter and receiver. And if I remove it from, you know where the, the um, phototransistor is, it's down there. Let me just cut the beam and you, you'll see. And if I remove that, it's still there. I've tried with three layers of tissue. Uh, it attenuates the signal too much. But it just goes to show that it would tolerate a little bit of interference in between. And the final thing I'd like to demonstrate is how the laser beam operates in a high brightness environment. And what I've got here is quite a powerful little torch. And I fire this at the tissue, which is attenuating the signal, but not enough to cause a problem. So here we go. I'm going to put the full beam, the main beam, on this tissue and see whether the signal still gets through and is not interfered with. So here goes. Look at that. So I'm firing the really quite a bright beam of light onto the tissue of which the phototransistor needs to find the signal. Thank you for viewing this video. It would be really helpful if you subscribed, shared and liked it.